The last lesson introduced total product curves, which could have axes like water holding fertilizer fixed versus Q, or fertilizer holding water fixed versus Q. And we got some kind of shapes like this and this in those in those uh, examples. From now on, there are going to be two important cases of total product curve shapes that I'm going to discuss. So, total product curves. Two important shapes. Now, it doesn't matter in talking about these two important shapes whether I use the example of water holding fertilizer fixed or a fertilizer holding water fixed, because I'm just talking about generic total product curves. For any kind of total product curves, I want to talk about these two important shapes. So I'll just pick one at random. I'll use water holding fertilizer fixed. The first shape, and an another word, instead of calling these two important shapes, I could call these two traditional shapes. They're the two shapes that the economists talk about most often. The first one, and of course we've got Q on the horizontal axis, and we're always going to be talking about situations where more water produces more corn, so these are going to be upward sloping. First one is concave everywhere. The second one is not concave everywhere. It starts out being convex. But then it becomes concave. Now you noticed in the previous lesson that the two graphs that I drew two examples of total product curves, they were concave. And so that is consistent with this picture. I'm going to be referring to these so often that instead of referring to the first one as a concave total product curve and a second one as a product as a total product curve that's convex in the beginning but then concave, I'm going to apply a shorthand. I'm going to call the first type one and the second type 2. These are not official terms. Therefore, I will not use them on exams. On an exam, instead of saying type 1, I'll say it's the total product curve is concave. And on type 2, I'll say the total product curve is, is concave eventually. Uh, I might add that then it starts out as convex. But even though type 1 and type 2 are unofficial terms, which I won't be using on exams, they will turn out to be pretty helpful in keeping track of what situations we're in in the upcoming lessons. Now, clearly since I have a total part curve, I can also talk about the marginal product. What I've these two large graphs are total product of water because I've got W on the horizontal axis. F is just being held constant. And so the relevant margins would be the marginal product of water. And given total product, marginal product is depicted by the slope of the tangent lines. In type 1, you can see that these tangent lines would start out pretty steep and then get flatter and then get flatter. And so marginal product would start out high and then get lower as you go from left to right. 
In the second example, the tangent lines start out fairly flat, then get steeper and steeper, which is the opposite pattern to what we had before, but then they become flatter and flatter. So the pattern for the marginal product of water, in this case, is low, high, low. In both cases, once you get to large amounts of water, the marginal product curve gets lower and lower. The, the shape is f becomes flatter and flatter. And that's a really important economic idea. So let me express it in other words before I write it down. The idea is that if you increase water holding fertilizer fixed, then then beyond some point, it happens in the beginning in type 1, in type 2 it only happens kind of in the middle. Increasing amounts of fertilizer, of water, I give you less and less additional quantity. For example, if I add one unit of water here, it gets me this much more corn. But if I add this one unit of water here, it only gets me that much corn. Similarly, one water, one extra uh, gallon of water here, it gets me this much corn. But one extra gallon of water here only gets me that much corn. So because the amount of fertilizer is held fixed, just adding more and more water to this will get you more corn, but increasingly less corn. The, the fixed amount of fertilizer is in some sense holding you back. So that extra units of corn beyond some point add more extra units of water beyond some point add more and more to corn output but not very much and this is a basic economic law I could say of principle it's called the law of diminishing returns So one way of expressing the law of diminishing returns is that total product curves eventually become concave. In type 1, the total product curve is always concave. In type 2, it's not always concave, but it eventually becomes concave. And the word eventually means for large w. An equivalent expression of the law of diminishing returns is that marginal product eventually falls. Let me write down these, these two equivalent expressions. The first one is a total product is eventually concave. The second is that marginal product eventually falls. In other words, eventually marginal product gets smaller and smaller as you go from left to right. I, I intentionally in the bottom right didn't write total product of water and total product of and marginal product of water because the law of diminishing returns is true for all inputs. So I've illustrated it with water here holding fertilizer fixed. Suppose one has 10 different inputs. Then a, the total product curve shows what happens when you change one of the inputs holding all the other nine inputs constant. And therefore the law of diminishing returns applies to the situation where you have all inputs fixed except for one. You're just varying one of them, you're holding all the others fixed. So it's like a, a cross-section in three dimensions along just one axis. And what it says is, well, that these such total product curves are eventually concave, such marginal product curves uh, eventually fall. If you're, let's say, changing one input holding nine inputs fixed. So that's what the law of diminishing returns is about. So diminishing returns means the return you get for adding an additional unit of the one variable input 
not adding any more units of anything else. So everything else is fixed. And it says that if you do that, then eventually you're going to get diminishing returns. This is completely and utterly different from returns to scale. Remember, returns to scale has the word scale in it. And the scale of a process is how big it is. So when you're asking about returns to scale, we doubled all the inputs to see what would happen to output. So when you have a returns to scale issue, you want to change all the inputs. When you have a law of diminishing returns issue, you just change one input. So with the with the law of diminishing returns, you just change one input only. Others are fixed. Whereas in the returns to scale issue, you change all the inputs. So there's a fundamental difference between marginal product, total product, and law diminishing returns on the one hand, which is where you're just changing one input, versus returns to scale where you're changing all the inputs. And, and the graphs are different too. The returns to scale graph, you, you'll recall if you have W and F, it's asking how far apart the isoquants are, or basically if you change inputs from here to here, whether that you whether you reach the out the isoquant that represents double output or not. Whereas in all the other graphs on this uh, screen, I don't have W and F. I have W and Q holding F fixed. So I'm just looking at a cross section of the three dimensional surface. So this is also completely different uh, between the returns to scale on the one hand and the law of diminishing returns on the other.